Hi, so this is one of the health law primers or part of the health series uh, that's run through Dalhousie University's Health Law Institute. This particular primer is about medical negligence. My name is Matthew Herder. I'm part of Dalhousie, Dalhousie's Health Law Institute. Contact details are there if you'd like to approach me to ask any questions about this content. The objectives for this primer are to describe the elements of negligence in Canadian law and secondly to think uh, in the course of discussing those elements about how the standard of care, the second key element of negligence law, applies particularly to medical residents. Okay, so as I just said uh, or indicated, negligence is made up of uh, elements. Canadian law or law generally tries to break concepts down like negligence into sort of subparts uh, and negligence is no exception. There are four elements. The first is that the physician or the defendant has to owe a duty of care. Secondly, he or she has to be shown to have not met that duty of care. In other words, not to have met the standard of care that applies in the given situation. Thirdly, there has to be damage that's worthy of compensation. And lastly, there has to be a causal link between the defendant's breach of the duty of care or standard of care and the injury that was actually suffered or the damage that was suffered. Those four elements can be thought of in terms of questions, right? When is a duty of care owed? How do courts determine what the standard of care is or should be? Um, thirdly, what kinds of damage count? And last, what's the threshold for establishing uh, cause in law? So in this primer, I'm actually going to focus only on the first, second, and fourth. Usually if something gets all the way to court, there's no question that uh, the patient has been uh, harmed in a meaningful way. Uh, so that's usually not at issue. Um, so I'm going to focus on the other th three elements of negligence. But you have to have all four um, in order to be liable uh, for negligence. I'm going to try and walk you through these elements by telling you stories from real Canadian cases. Um, and that'll sort of flesh out what these concepts or elements mean in more detail. Right? As I just said, I'm not going to talk about damage, just the other three elements of negligence. So let's start with a duty of care. Um, and this is a, based on a really old case from England, uh, sort of beginning of the 20th century. Um, and it was a case involving a woman named Mrs. Donahue who bought a bottle of ginger beer from a corner store in Scotland and as she finished her drink she noticed that there was a decomposed snail at the bottom of it and so she promptly sued the manufacturer of that drink um, the, a company called Stevenson uh, for negligence. So do you think she won? Did Ms. Donahue uh, win her her case? Um, it might not be surprising to you now, but at the time uh, when the court, the House of Lords in Britain said, yes, uh, she's entitled to compensation, it was revolutionary. The idea that she would owe, a du uh, the manufacturer owed her a duty of care, even though um, she didn't have a direct relationship with them, right? She bought the bottle of beer from a corner store. Um, that was that was considered pretty revolutionary. And the House of Lords set out this general principle of if these two conditions are met, then a duty of care is owed. The two conditions are that there's a reasonable foreseeability of harm between someone's acts and omissions and, uh, and the injury or the harm in question, and also that there's a degree of proximity between those two things, right? We don't want there to be um, just because there isn't a direct relationship, uh, we don't want the plaintiff or the, the person who suffers harm not to be able to be compensated for that. Um, but there can't be, you know, a huge amount of time that's gone by necessarily or, you know, think of 20 actors in, in a sort of production chain. There might be um, too much space or different actors in between them uh, for liability to follow. So those two criteria were established in this old case and that really set up this idea of a duty of care to one's neighbor, um, even if you may not directly cause the act that leads to harm. Um, if you're involved enough, uh, you have a duty of care. This is seldom at issue in the context of uh, lawsuits in, in, uh, against physicians. Right? They have a clear duty of care to patients that are under their care. 
Uh, but there are sometimes cases that ask, you know, how far does that go? What about non-patients? Well, the cases go both ways. Uh, think about a patient who has some kind of infection, they're part of a family, the family members are actually under that physician's duty of care, even though they're not his or her patient, right? Because you have to think about the risk of infection. In other cases, um, physicians don't owe a duty of care. Uh, for example, to a patient, to parents, um, uh, when they're treating a child, when there's a, an allegation of child abuse, right? Recognizing a duty of care to the parents in that kind of situation would create a clear conflict with other duties, such as the duty of confidentiality that the, patient, the physician owes to the minor. So there, they're not within the duty of care. Um, but apart from those kinds of situations, uh, it's, as I said, a duty of care uh, that it exists is really not at issue very often in negligence cases uh, because there's a clear duty to one's patients. The real fight, um, or one of the bigger fights, tends to, to focus on what the standard of care was and whether the physician actually uh, met that standard of care. Okay, so the general principle um, about what the standard of care is has, has basically been unchanged since the 1950s in Canadian law. Have a, have a moment to, to read the general principle from this case. So it's about what a normal prudent practitioner would do, someone with the uh, same experience, similar standing. Um, and if someone has more expertise, if they're a specialist, there might be a higher standard of care that's expected of them. Um, this general principle sort of translates into a few key points, right? So the first key point is that consistency with common practice suggests the standard of care has been met. If you have, have followed what's standard practice, um, that's a pretty good indication that you've met the standard of care. Um, the standard of care is it evolves over time, right? Practices change. So if someone says that you were negligent, they can't interpret uh, what you did in light of the sort of present practice, they have to interpret that in, in light of practice at the time where the negligence uh, allegedly occurred. Um, and obviously figuring that out means you have to have evidence and courts pay great attention to what experts, uh, physicians, the profession says about what standard of care really is at a given point in time for a given situation, right? So courts don't define it themselves, they rely on others, uh, the profession primarily, to articulate what the standard of care is at a given time. So think about that point, that the profession has a fair bit of control, even though it's a legal case in which this is playing out over what the standard is. Think about that idea as you read this uh, set of facts for a moment. So it was standard practice to do as this physician did, um, and if I said that usually means the standard of care has been met in a legal sense, do you think that the physician was liable in this case? And the answer is actually yes, right? Which yields a caveat to that general rule, right? And that that's that it, it's not quite as simple as just meeting what standard practice to meet the standard of care in a legal sense. Obviously, risky things uh, can constitute violations of the standard of care, although complicated, highly technical procedures are outside of that realm of obvious risk, right? But there's, there's a little bit of nuance there. Um, let's pause as we're talking about the standard of care and think about residents in particular. As I mentioned, uh, that's the second objective for this primer. Um, Unfortunately, this is an area of Canadian law that is pretty unsettled, in my opinion. Um, there are several different standards in play. The first is, is sort of a low standard that equates the resident to a reasonable physician. Um, there's a middle standard that holds the resident accountable to something in between a reasonable physician and a specialist. And then finally, a higher standard that more or less equates residents with specialists. So in this sort of mess of standards, um, I think there's at least one thing that's clear that's important for you to take away. 
even if a court were to take the lower standard, and that is the most common approach based on my assessment of the cases right now, um, it will not lower the standard of care expected to be given to patient. In fact, I would say that courts have placed emphasis on residents taking active steps to acknowledge the limits of their experience to date. For example, by communicating their relative inexperience to patients, and for hospitals and supervising physicians and specialists to ensure adequate supervision is in place. Right, so a bit messy to know exactly what the legal uh, standard is, but in that uh, context of uncertainty, it creates sort of added obligations to be clear about one's experience, one's expertise, what kind of supervision is in place in the provision of care in order to ensure that the standard of care. Uh, is met if a resident's involved. Okay, uh, so keep that in the back of your mind when you're thinking about your particular situation if you're a resident. Uh, let's jump back into the main objective of looking at the key elements of ne negligence. Um, as I've said, uh, the issue of damage is usually not an issue uh, uh, by the time something gets all the way to court. So the bigger issue um, is the, the last element of causation. Here's the general principle um, about what it means for uh, causation to be established. It's the basic idea of but for uh, the physician's conduct, the patient would not have suffered the injury, right? So it's a but-for test in legal terms. There's a, a, a test that's used in some situations called a material contribution test. Um, that's sort of an evolving area of the law that's beyond the scope of this particular module. The general test is this but-for test. So keeping that general principle of but-for uh, physician's contact, harm followed, um, uh, think about whether that test has been met in this particular case. Take a moment to read these facts. If you haven't finished, just pause there for a minute to keep reading. I'll continue for the time being. Um, so there's no question in this case that the ophthalmologist met the standard of care. He didn't. The legal issue in this case was, did his failure to meet the standard of care cause the injury? So what do you think? According to the Supreme Court of Canada, the answer was yes. And that's probably fairly surprising to you. So there's a couple of points you can take away from that. The first, and these points are, are sort of more or less two ways of stating the same thing. Legal causation and scientific causation are not the same thing. Right. In this case, it wasn't because there was more than one cause, right? Um, the natural causes, and then the physician's decision to continue the operation. That didn't mean that there was no causation. What the court said was, look, uh, we're concerned about um, patients who've been harmed and protecting them. And so where the physician does something, in this case continuing the surgery, that actually makes it impossible to sort out, scientifically speaking, what the cause really was, then we're going to infer causation, right? Um, and that's because we really want to make sure that the law offers a remedy to patients who've been hurt quite seriously. Okay, so that's the sort of wrinkle with causation. It's not quite the same as scientifically. Do we know this with absolute certainty is the cause? Legal causation is, is um, uh, uh, less grounded in absolute scientific uh, um, causation. Okay, with those points, you've, you've basically got a good summary of medical negligence under Canadian law. A lot of those cases uh, went against the, against the physician. So I'm going to try and wind up on a more constructive uh, note. So let's start with a, a dark note first, which is that um, if, assuming the data from this study done uh, almost 15 years ago now, um, uh, remains relatively accurate, there are an awful lot of uh, adverse events uh, resulting in, in acute care patient death in Canada, right? In theory, every single one of those adverse events could trigger a lawsuit for negligence, right? But um, despite the sort of flavor of the cases that I've talked you through and those statistics, um, the actual number 
of uh, lawsuits in this country is relatively low. So based on data from the Canadian Medical Protective Association, you see that the number has actually been going down in recent years, and it's still about 13 lawsuits per 1,000 physicians in this country. Indeed, most lawsuits, and pulling out some more data from the CMPA, uh, that go to court, um, if, you, if you take a second to look through these numbers, um, fewer and fewer of them actually continue very far in the litigation process, and many of them, if they actually make it to a point where um, a judge makes a decision, most of them uh, are in the favor of the physician, uh, not the patient. Right, um, and there are sort of complicated reasons for that, but the the reason why I'm putting this data before you is to suggest, look, though it's critical to know a lot about the law and, and the standards that are in place, um, but hopefully law and knowledge of it can serve a more constructive role. The odds of you actually being sued, let alone sued successfully for negligence, are fairly low. Um, and I think it's important to try and keep this sort of empirical landscape in mind because a lack of understanding about negligence in other areas of law has um, been associated with defensive medicine practices in the United States. Um, my guess would be we'd find a similar thing if someone does study in Canada, right? Ordering unnecessary tasks, um, referring to other physicians, um, and so on. All of these things carry risks of their own, not to mention lots of cost to the system, to patients. Um, and so a lack of knowledge about law uh, can really unfortunately lead to some of these practices. So I'm hoping that knowledge of negligence, even knowledge um, of cases where principles came out uh, where, that didn't uh, uh, go in the physician's favor, can still be really useful and lead you to avoid defensive medicine practices. Um, so that's the more constructive note that I wanted to, to leave this on knowledge of negligence law can hopefully inform your practice and, and usefully so. I'll just stop by saying that uh, please keep in mind this is not legal advice. I'm happy to take questions if you write to me, matthew.herder at dal.ca, um, but it's not legal advice uh, in any kind of formal way. And finally, uh, I should credit the Health Law Institute and Dalhousie University support for enabling me uh, to make this primer, and I hope it's useful to you and your practice. Thank you very much.